good morning and welcome to Shelf Indulgence Book Chats, the podcast where we chat with authors who are connected in some way to the homeschooling community. Today, I have with me Dr. Rhonda Johnson. Dr. Johnson is the owner of the Center for Counseling and Family Relationships, which was established in 2007. Dr. Johnson received her Master's in Marriage and Family Counseling from Southwestern Seminary in 1999, when she began working in private practice. She received her license as a professional counselor in 2001. Dr. Johnson completed her doctorate in psychology slash counseling in 2003, along with her license as a marriage and family therapist. She became an LPC supervisor and an LMFT supervisor in 2007. Dr. Johnson also became a registered play therapist supervisor in 2014. She became an approved clinical supervisor in 2022. Dr. Johnson is also the co-author of two workbooks for families, Family Connections, Preparing a Family for a Foster Care Slash Adoption Journey, and Family Connections, Finding a Family in a Foster Care Adoption a Journey. Today, she is here to chat with her with us about her book, Pace Setter, Leadership and Culture and Mental Health. Change the trajectory of your career and your organization by leading intentionally and claiming culture from any position. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. It's an honor to be able to be asked. So, you are probably one of the busiest moms, working moms, professionals, women that I have I have encountered in, in my 47 years. So I am really humbled that you would take the time to chat with us so that we can also take this moment to help raise up other moms. So tell us a little bit about um, the many hats that you do wear. And oh my goodness, just a few mm-hmm. of them I, I can just throw out now. Clinician, advocate, supervisor, practice owner, athlete and Mm -hmm. hybrid homeschool mom oh my goodness (laughs) do you sleep (laughs) (laughs) yes there are a lot of hats i mean we all you know wear a lot of hats that we do and with the schooling journey that as you know as a mom every year just assessing year by year what the best you know option to pursue is so we've done public school and we've done full homeschool and we've done that hybrid homeschool now for six years so um, my daughter will be a senior this year. So that's, it's looked different over the years because yeah. obviously mm-hmm. as children age, there are different needs and different things you're preparing for along the way, which is the same story with all the other things that you mentioned, you know, from owning a practice and, you know, even being in a marriage and all the things that we mm-hmm. do is, you know, there's growth and opportunity to develop, you know, in every area of life, you know, it's all for control. So. So we all do them. So it's a lot of blending. I wouldn't say I do any of them, you know, um, you know, extremely well or <laughs> am a perfectionist <laughs> to any of them because there's too many mm-hmm. things, you know. So like all of us, you know, there are, there are situations where we, we move forward with what we have right then, you know, and sometimes whether it's, you know, in parenting or whether it's with work or whether it's with life or schooling or whatever, you know, when you see a ball that drops, you're trying to pick that one back up, you know, yeah. figure out how to get back on track and all things. So I think that's, you know, that's the truth, even with the book, you know, as I wrote it, mm-hmm. as well as all the other roles. So I don't look at all of those credentials and, you know, achievements and, and things of speaking as to who I am. There are things that I felt led to do, you know, in the moment. Mm-hmm. And to help others in some way, but it it wasn't necessarily just accruing them. So we're all humans, and we're, you know we're attempting to do the best we can, hopefully with what we have in that moment. So yeah, that is absolutely true. I, I have actually said before. Sometimes you just take that cape and you turn it around, you use it as a bib, you wipe your face, and you go on. So. That's right. That's exactly. It. So we we all are gonna you know have things we wish we had done differently. You know uh, yes. we're all gonna have weaknesses. Um, but at the same time, those are our strengths too. You know, I'm looking at how we can use those in a positive way. Absolutely. And I think it's all grist for the mill. 
if you mm-hmm. will. It's 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 the pains that go into growing pains of growth. And if we can mm-hmm. glean something from that and then turn around and share with the person who's coming behind us, that that's really what it's about. Mm-hmm. Talk a little bit about your book, Pace Setter. And this was an absolutely wonderful read. I don't want to say that it was a quick read. I will say that it was an, an, a, an enlightening read. I would say that you should definitely take your time and go through it because it's more than just about your journey. You are reaching back and taking that next person. You're taking that reader along the journey so that they can grow. There were parts in this book where I put it down and went, I'm not ready to answer that yet. And that's okay. <laughs> that's part of the growth journey. And that that is so powerful about this book. But what inspired you to write your book? Mm-hmm. Sure. I mean, at that point in time, I was leading a lot of trainings and being called out to do a lot of things. And people always had a lot of questions. And there were a couple of things that were developing and was that even on the break times or before the training, after the training, it was just, it led to a lot of talking, you know, and conversation mm-hmm. without break, um, which was always a struggle. And so mm-hmm. recognizing, you know, where is a place that they can really get the information that they're wanting from me, because obviously it's needed and I don't have another place to point them to. And so that was part of it. It became, you know, I'd rather this be, I could spend all my time at that point in time too. I had started doing some coaching and consultation for people. Some were thinking about starting practice. Some were starting practice. Some had been doing practice. And I honestly was running out of time to even do those. You know, it's like, yes, you can price it at a certain point, you know, but it's Mm -hmm. just the time. We only have two resources in life and that's time and money. And so it became, you know, where can I, where can I pour some time where it will have a bigger impact if people truly wanted to take that step to pursue the information and not just use my time? How could I get that to them? Um, And so it wasn't, it definitely was not about, you know, trying to do consults and create some role, you know, or title that I would be doing or money making you know, adventure. Sure. It was more about a place, you know, to put the information. And sometimes as I was doing those consultations, what I found is that everybody has different expectations. Obviously we all go into things with expectations and just different goals. And the fun things that I really am talking about with our practice and how we got started didn't have to do with, you know, how does what tax entity to use and, you know, Uh, these nitty gritty details that they were fine, but that wasn't really, that wasn't my joy and my passion, which was more about what made us different and the culture that I had set up in the practice. And those aren't things that I could communicate well in short 10 minute conversations, you know, in a 30 minute break that we had um, as people would line up. And so wherever I was, it was more about, you know, also providing the opportunity for those who wanted to take that initiative. Like I said, I've always been someone who was more motivated if I knew what to do and the steps to take, then I was more than willing to follow through and had been doing that myself um, in business coaching for six years before I wrote the book. So I knew what I was like as a coaching participant and wanted to provide something for those who didn't have access to there's not really business coaches there are there are options and resources in our field um but you know not necessarily focusing on culture and what what Mm -hmm. my passion was and so so i think it's a number of those things it was time it was how to get it to more people it was for those who had more initiative to seek that it was for me having been a participant and knowing what a difference it made and just wanting to make an impact, you know, for those who wanted to do things differently. Because there are so many ways to go about doing business or life or roles that we're in. And in this book, really, that's the that behind it, is it doesn't matter mm-hmm. what role you're in, you know, or what job it may be, um, or even that it has to be a job. But it's really just thinking through why am I doing what I'm doing and how to do like, what is that point of success? So all those questions that are included within the book. So that was the real heart behind it. 
And the heart is so there. It is so evident. It was taking you, I'm not going to say a total therapy journey, but definitely a self-inventory. You are mm-hmm. going, as you, as you read through this, you are going to be challenged to ask yourself the hard questions. It, as I said earlier, I don't know that I want to answer that yet, or I don't know that I know the answer to that yet. And it helps mm-hmm. you be- get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because there's nothing, even though we, we've been through grad school, we've both been through therapy, and because they kind of make you go through that, if you're going to be a good therapist, you need to know what it's like to sit on the other side. But this, mm-hmm. it is incredibly uncomfortable to hold up that mirror and do that self-evaluation and that self-assessment. But in order to be mm-hmm. successful, you have to. Mm-hmm. You have well, to. So much of life becomes looking back, you can see the tapestry, you know, that gets mm-hmm. woven over time or the race that you've been on. And unfortunately, if we're not intentional, we don't always like where the end of it ends up. And so it takes that being intentional and even trying to do those things. That's what the book is about. It's like every mistake, you know, I've made that I've something I wish I would have done differently. And mm-hmm. so looking back, I can see those, you know, I saw the wisdom that I had access to at the time. But absolutely, it was like the only shortcut that we get is seeking wisdom from another. And so if I could provide others that shortcut, then I wanted to do it. Yes. It's a call to action and it's an invitation to courage. It it really is because courage is certainly not the absence of fear is doing it afraid anyway. To show mm-hmm. yourself that you can come out the other side doesn't mean you'll come out unscathed. <laughs> Mm-hmm. that you will well, be all, stronger for it. We all face those fears. What I mean, that yes. never ends. You know, those fears True. are daily. Of, and that discomfort is daily. You know, even mm-hmm. Taya's had discomforts with it. So mm-hmm. even when you pursue the things that you know you should be doing and the doors that have opened around you, it doesn't mean that it's not uncomfortable in the process, you know, or that it doesn't mm-hmm you know, that it doesn't require a lot of courage, you know, every day to continue moving forward because it does. It does. And I will say from personal experience, there's nothing more empowering than coming out that other side because no one gave that to you. You earned it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So personal inventory is hard. You are exactly right. So every day is can be hard. It's a journey. It's not meant to be easy. We all want to press the easy button. <laughs> sure, it <laughs> just doesn't exist when it comes to it comes to it a lot really of the roles that we're in. Mm-hmm. Very true, very true. But I think it's so empowering for. It, um, I speak mainly to moms, but especially from moms to hear that because I think we are by far our greatest critics. Um, whether it's social media or whether it's current culture, we look at these images that people put out there that make it look so easy. Whereas behind me, my office looks really nice and pristine. But if I were to pan this camera just a little bit to the left, you would see about three different piles of school mm-hmm. stuff that is ready to get to go for my son to start next week. But that's okay. In all honesty, I can pan the camera and be okay with that. And we should all be okay mm-hmm. with that. Mm-hmm. So it's about challenging those unrealistic expectations we set for ourselves too. Absolutely. And and we all do that, especially if we, you know, are achievers or, you know, have mm-hmm. goals in our mind. We all wake up with expectations every day. And often as moms or even as business owners or workers, mm-hmm. I mean, that is derailed within 10 minutes. You know, it does not take long. Mm-hmm. <laughs> for all of the plans and goals of the day to, you know, to be derailed to children or to workers or to whoever, you know, has a need around us. Like if they need us, you know, for one reason or another, there's, there's something there. And so it's how do we have a relationship, you know, with others in our lives that we're responsible for and those we love, you know, and those that, that have been put in our stewardship and how do we do that? Well, yeah. Well said. So well said. Well, tell us about the title of your book, Pace Setter. You shared in it, you are quite the athlete. You've been athletic most of your life. But tell us how you chose the title Pace, Pace Setter and where that metaphor comes from in your book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as the book is the framework of it came to me. And I think that I never set out 
to do most of the things that I'm doing or have done. And writing a book was not on my bucket list either. So if that makes anyone feel better, you know, sometimes I'm just like, can I get through the responsibilities today? But as I started working on an outline for it, that outline really came and I wrote about that but just within a few days. It's not that the book was done, you know, but the, the skeleton of it and starting out with this many words for each chapter came really quickly, you know, within there was, I think, one three-day period I had and then another three-day period. And so there was a lot more time that came after that and help and ghostwriting and other things um, to help in the process. But as I did that, I wanted really a topic that made sense so that it would come outside of the field if it needed to, like we're doing today, where Mm -hmm. it could be useful, you know, for anyone to read and something that other people could identify with, you know, what are things, even if you haven't run, you probably know someone who have, or you've watched, you know, a marathon on TV or, you know, you've Mm -hmm. social media, like all the things, Mm -hmm. um, you may not know all the intricacies of it, but enough familiarity. And Mm -hmm. so running became one of those things because I felt like it was a really good uh, metaphor and symbol of the journey that I had been on. Sometimes we don't know where that race is headed or where that journey is going. We know why we're on it and we have some hopes for some end goals, but we can't control all those factors. Um, And so I think that was it. It really symbolized for me starting out you know, with that baby step of just, let me just run and then a 5k, you know, and then a 10k and then a, and then a marathon and then, and then just stepping out of running altogether, you know, and <laughs> stepping away mm-hmm. from it. So, and now not having done it, you know, for quite a while too. So, so it's choosing that point in time, you know, just like life, what makes sense at this point in time and why does that make sense? And if running was something that gave me a metaphor for the book, you know, it kept me in shape during that point in time. And met some people along the way and, you know, was able to accomplish some things I never knew I'd be able to, you know, then that was, you know, those were some joys that came from it. And when the time came to be able to step away, I could do. So the title, we, you know, wrestled back and forth. It was like pacemaker, but then that sounds like a, you know, a heart transplant or a heart surgery or like, you know, it has a whole other connotation, you know, that goes along with it of surgery and and heart. And so pace setter is another symbol and, you know, just title that really comes from the church that we've been involved in, which is mentioned throughout the church, throughout the book. And Mm -hmm. so that was just one more thing of being a pace setter for others. And when you run a race, you know, I remember one, I didn't even write about, but there was someone I thought, okay, I'll stay with them. They're saying that they're running at this pace, which is the pace they didn't run at that pace. <laughs> so, so you can get off track, you know, following the yeah. wrong person really easily. And so I wanted it to be some of the things that we have done well. You know, I don't look at it as things I've done well. I just look at it as, you know, a whole and as a culture and as an organization um, and with the people that, that I put my life to mentor along the way, that's, these were things we were able to accomplish. And so pace that are, you know, made sense. So the rest of it, the leadership and culture were the two biggest learnings that I had along the way, uh, just in, as a mom or as an owner, or even in whatever job you're doing, even if you're working under someone, uh, doing administrative responsibilities, mm-hmm. you have that choice to lead. And the position and the responsibility and the stewardship you've been given, or you have the choice, you know, just to, I guess, experience it and you're just letting it happen to you, but you're not leading in the situation. Mm -hmm. And so leadership can happen no matter what we're doing and was the biggest, I think, learning for me and learning to lead because I was so much more of, can we just keep the peace? Can we just have (laughs) them? Just like you want things to be easy at home, you know, wanted yeah. things to be easy here. Um, and the culture was the other big learning because every family, every business, every church, every nonprofit, mm-hmm. every volunteer organization, it has a culture. It mm-hmm. may never be written down or never be said out loud, but it does have one. And I, those were the two things that really were transformational for me um, and being able to learn and grow and to continue to keep us on track. You know, as versus just letting things happen to me, I could actually lead out 
and versus letting everyone do what made sense to them, we could set a culture that we have to do. That is such a beautiful testimony to mindset, or as we would say, locus of control, if you wanted to learn that. But there's something that it means taking that powering out that the world can either happen to you or you can take control of what you put out there on the world. So a life is going mm -hmm. to throw events at you. There's there's no way around that. But the one thing you do have control over is what you do with it and how you respond. And once you shift that mindset, and it can take a while, it can take a while. That's part of the, the pain and the growth, if you will. Mm -hmm. But once you shift mm -hmm. that mindset and you stay back, you, you don't go back. <laughs> because it <laughs> right. is that you empowering. Take it, on. <laughs> well, it is that empowering. Well, and we tend to, from when we're children all the way to growing up, we try to take control of things that are really not in our stewardship. You know, I'll try to control yes. my spouse or my child or, you know, someone else. Or why are they doing this? Why are they making my life miserable? <laughs> Whatever it might be. <laughs> but the yeah. reality is everyone's doing what makes sense to them. And that I have to look at what do I have ownership of? Like, is this truly mine to lead out with? And if it's not, then I've got the opportunity to either pray for that other person and to hope that they get a vision for what they need to take on or, you know, that I will be a follower to them that examples what they need to take on. But when I'm trying to take control of things that aren't mine, it's pretty miserable for me and others around me. And when I'm not taking control of what I should, that is also pretty miserable. You know, whether I'm not setting boundaries with my child because for the 15th time I've had to say no today, you know, or whether it's, you know, having to say no, even though I truly care, you know, for everyone in every setting that I'm in, sometimes I have to say, no, I can't accommodate that time, you know, or I can't yes. accommodate that, that wish that you have. I would love that for you too, but that's not, you know, the commitment that's required from being here, you know, whether it's in the practice or whether it's volunteering, you know, on a team that I'm leading or wherever it might be, it can be in a new setting. So I have been on both sides, you know, the person who, who tried to control things that were not my stewardship, as well as the person who wasn't taking ownership of the things that I should have been, you know, so it's through those flaws that we grow. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think the biggest part of it is in speaking to this is that part of culture. Nine times out of 10, we don't realize that we're in culture because your normal is your normal. And if you've not been exposed to anything else or anything different, you kind of don't know any different. So that's where it goes back to that key of awareness. And then when you get in a different environment or a different situation, you can go, oh, wait a minute. It doesn't have to be this way. I can, as you said several times in your book, I don't have to work harder. I can work smarter. I can, I can do things differently and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it doesn't mean that there aren't problems even when you work smart. <laughs> this means that there that's are no so true. <laughs> so I encourage you, you know, to, you know, all the things that I've done and, you know, even through the book, it's about, you know, giving encouragement because even with this, it's not look at all, you know, that's been accomplished. It's more about, it was really tough and none of that was easy. And, you know, we look back at junior high and lots of times in life and say, I wouldn't want to do that again. I would do them again for the growth. But, but even now there are things that I'm through that I'm like, I don't want to go through this again. You know, I want to learn from this so that I don't have to repeat. So it doesn't matter where we're at in life or what roles we have. There's always this some discontentment that's there with something in some area. So there's always growth and the need to find contentment and also find how do I need to challenge myself? And is this happening because I'm not doing something I should to lead out or to create a culture with my kids or my spouse, or my family? Am I the very reason, you know, that the struggle is there too? And for me, it, the answer was yes. I was a big part. Mm -hmm you know, of the struggle when it came to the practice and the organization, everyone, you know, with us, you know, I believe that they could, you know, me too, but at the same time, when everyone does what makes sense to them, it's hard to be on this, in the same race together. So. Yes. 
Yes, your book shares so many different things and so many areas of encouragement from knowing yourself to having the courage to face the things, you know, that I think one well, A, it's making a fearless and moral inventory, but it's basically taking a look at the good, the bad, the ugly, and the beautiful and accepting it unconditionally right where right. you are so that you can grow from that. But I will mm -hmm. say all that you were just saying about the, you know, life is about problem solving problems. Sometimes they're little fires, sometimes they're big. But even as I was reading your book, it gave me an opportunity. I have a son who's 10 and it gave me an opportunity, you know, 10 year old problems are bad, depending on the 10 year old are vastly different than what we face, you know, in our force. But, you know, when he would face his struggles and the way he was, you know, dealing with it at the moment, I was like, you know what, sweetie, it gave me an opportunity to share this from, from your book on his level and his understanding of, you know, that kind of stinks, right? But you know what? Even for mommy and daddy, we still have little fires that we're putting out every day. You may not see them and we may not share them, but here, I'll give you a few examples. And he's like, that kind of stinks. I'm like, it kind of does. I'm like, it's not a grim tale for me to tell you that, yes, you know what? This is not going to end. You're not going to find that one magic solution. And then you will never have problems ever again. You're going to have them for the remainder of your life. But that's okay. You may not have the answers right now. That's okay. Mm -hmm. We'll get to them when we get to them. And it's, there's, there's faith in here as well about you don't have to have all the answers right now. You don't even have to do this in your own strength. In fact, God doesn't want you to. His strength is mm -hmm. always there. One of my favorite components that you talked about in here too was the comfort and community and surrounding yourself and that comfort of community where you had, you know, we're, I've always viewed that we're never completely out of supervision. You can call it consultation once mm -hmm. you're past your licensure and whatsoever, okay. but there's nothing more beautiful than having a mentor, but you took a different approach on it that I actually never thought about. I've always sought out the mentorship to be a mentee from those above me. Nothing more terrifying to me than the thought of when I became the mentor. I'm like, oh, wait, wait a minute. I'm not ready. Wait a minute. I'm not ready for this. You brought in that extra component of bringing someone under your wing. And that is your group. You have someone who's about 10 years ahead of you and someone about 10 years behind you. And what you learn from each other in that group is absolutely beautiful. Like, why was this not available when we were in graduate school? Mm -hmm. The lessons that you have learned and honed from and really paid attention to you put inside this book. I'm like every graduate student, every college student, every life student, every parent can benefit. I'll be honest from the life lessons in this book. You don't have to be in mental health or business because this is about culture. This is about heart. This is about community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, what you've created in your community with intention, with purpose, is beautiful. And these are lessons that we all need to learn. Mm -hmm. There's just, there's such disconnection, you know, at this point in life with, a, you know, with just in general, with clients that we see coming through the practice, with friends, you know, that I know and through others. And some of them, sure, can be from COVID. Some of them is just the culture that we're in. and you know, this isolation that can happen and withdraw and just not being mm -hmm. part of communities in general. But it, that really has been, I mean, the, the lifesaver for me has always been having those, yes, who were ahead of me. Just like, hey, if, if, if I have something that has really made a difference for me, then I should desire to want to share that, you know, with someone else. I'm not just going to hoard that, you know, on my own. So how do I pass that on? And so continuing that, you know, now I can look a lot of different ways, you know, in personal life and as a mom, it's going to be having people who are decades ahead, you know, in the age or for children or whatever it might be to seek wisdom. It doesn't mean that I do everything they did, but if I can understand and be able to come up with, you know, my husband and I can then come up with what they think the answers are for us. You know, there are people mm -hmm. who will pull me aside and you know, church wanting to know about what about racing, you know, my son is five and this is going on, you know, where's our daughter's older at this point. And so it's fun to see that, you know, we do, all of us have learned things through our journey. There are things that work in value. Are they being used by others, you know, pouring into others? And you know, that's what your podcast, you know, obviously is in a lot of things. 
that you're doing. So it doesn't have to be a job or a title. Mm-hmm. You know, it can be more about um, whatever stewardship you have. Is how am I seeking others who are ahead of me so I can avoid pitfalls that they've been through? They can I can learn from their mistakes and never have to go through it. Also, how can I help others? You know, do the same by hearing some of the things that I've done differently. You know, going into them. So yes, that's that's a big part of the mentor. You know, piece and really seeking out that wisdom for the growth and then sharing yourself. And, you know, whether it is you know, faith elements of life and wanting to grow, you know, and my faith and growing closer to God, whether it's just wanting to grow as a press owner within the field, whether it's, you know, as a friend and realizing I'm lacking in some areas where we, and yet again, you know, I'm in a training program that's a five-year program. So I'm constantly putting myself under you know, mentors. I mean, there's never been a point in life because I sought them out. So whether it was for the business mm-hmm. or whether it's for spiritual growth or whether it was for, you know, personal in one avenue or another. And it's hard because it's hard to get that feedback if you really ask yes. for it. Like, what's it like to be on the other side of me? You know, what's it like for my child to experience me? You know, mm-hmm. I hear that mm-hmm. sometimes and I don't love those answers. What's it like for my spouse to experience yes. me? What's it like for my employees to experience me? What's it like for others that are on a volunteer team that I may lead or be a part of? So using it, you know, in in the field, we called it the Jahari window, but it's like, what are the things I I know about myself and others know too? What are the things they don't know about myself that they know? That's that being on the other side of me. You know, what are the things that I know that I'm not sharing with them? Because I'm using discretion. That's more personal or private. And then there's the fourth window, which are the things none of us know. So so it's constantly seeking feedback, you know, through those different windows of experiencing myself through someone else. You know, what are the things I want others to experience with me? Am I ignoring, you know, intentionally, or am I using discretion so that others aren't getting a sense of me? I don't want them to. So so I'm just I think we constantly, you know, and I'm trying to constantly just evaluate and consider, like, what am what am I presenting, you know, to others, and and that's what the book is because it's the culture the leader that I'm exampling, you know, in whatever realm I'm in. Well, in all honesty, even though your book is is speaking to in the title to mental health, I would challenge that this book is applicable across so many different audiences, from working moms to working homeschool moms, to parents in general, to professionals and to laypersons alike. The book is very user friendly and because basically the heart of it is heart and challenging your growth and fostering and growing and nurturing the relationships in our lives. Your book takes us on a journey and you share so much of your personal journey in this book with the beautiful metaphor of pace setting your life and pace setting your goals and learning from your trials. Can you share a little bit or speak to your journey in this book and maybe some of the biggest challenges you faced and the lessons that you learned from them that would benefit our listeners? (laughs) Sure. I think there are so many. Um, I would think the things that would be most helpful, I mean, lessons learned probably goes back to what we're speaking to. Most of us don't go into the counseling realm or helping profession, whether it's teaching or nursing or you know any of those fields, you know, because we really like conflict. Most of us are wanting to help others. Yeah. And for me, and, you know, personally, a lot of my personality was harmony and really prizing that, you know, so even more than, you know, helping others, I would say is wanting all of us to be at peace, you know, and headed in the same way and not wanting that discontentment. But the reality is that a lot of times I've had to learn to lean in to conversations, you know, that were hard ones. There are some I'm even having today, of course, while I'm, you know, doing this podcast and here today, going to have to have some hard conversations. You know, even when we think that we, you know, have mastered something, there are others we're aligned with, we're all moving towards the same thing. 
is that then we'll hit another hurdle, you know, or growth or development. And we're in one of those now, you know, when we started, you know, obviously I had to learn, and that's part of the book about choosing a culture, not just letting everyone choose it for me, about leading out. Okay, so mastered having the smaller group. And then as we grew on this last retreat, we just had in June, we had 32. When we started doing retreats, you know, over seven years ago, we maybe had, I think we had 10. There's a big difference between having one child and having four children. There's a big difference between <laughs> leading two and leading 32. You know, it it's mm-hmm. just um, ever evolving. And so it takes continually, you know, leaning into hard things finding ways to do it in a way that is still caring because internally it's like, why is this, why, why am I dealing with this yet again? I thought that I had set this boundary with my child, or I thought that we had set some structure at work, or I thought that we had, you know, done this. And why are we here again? Well, it's just part of life and growth and development, but also just looking at each one as an opportunity you know, to say, sure, again, to figure out culture again, to, to figure out the why behind why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so every role I'm in, I think, is continuing to evolve. And that wasn't always planned either. You know, but my husband would say, you know, you went from being a counselor to being an owner. That's what's in the book. From the, Since I've written the book, it's gone from being an owner to figure out, you know, kind of being a CEO where there's much more time in meetings. And it's trying to figure out, you know, what to delegate, what I still, how do I not be disconnected from those around me, even though I have to be at a high level to maintain what we're doing because there are so many of us and we've got to continue to in the same direction. So wearing multiple hats has always been, none of us like, normally, none of us like struggles and conflict mm-hmm. and trials. And those are just, they've been a part of every phase, you know, that we've been in. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the hard thing is like, how do you maintain relationship? That's another piece of how do you maintain relationship when you're in multiple roles with people? Mm -hmm. You know, so I've created, you know, and my spouse, my mom, and my daughter all work within the practice and different, they have different jobs too. So not only do we have our personal role as a daughter, you know, or as a mom or as a spouse, but then we're throwing in roles, you know, within the office and we're throwing in again, boundaries and like structure and, and just, it leads to more, it can lead to more confusion, but it can also lead to more greatness, you know, too. So a lot of things in my life have intertwined and they're not compartmentalized, you know, like some people are able to do. It's not like work is even here and home is here at any family gathering because I'm in a small family with one sibling, doesn't have children, and I only have one. Topics often can go to work because both of my parents have been involved in the practice at different points in time. So it's just an example of it. It never (laughs) leaves. So I think those are challenges, too. They have been great joys, you know, to team together and for every person within you know my life who is cared for and loved for me to want to support what we're doing and to to see it be successful it's not just about me being successful so you know that dislike for harmony and conflict when you have to lean into things is hard the intertwining of relationships to where there are multiple roles and so when someone when it's time for them to leave you know the practice then that means sometimes relationships have to change and that's hard so wearing, you know, being a friend and a coworker and a boss, you know, and, and, and all the things at the end of the day, the reality is the boss role, boss role. I don't like that term, but it's what they use, you know, too. And so it, to me, it has that connotation of like harsh and controlling and domineering. But I, I look at that role as just coming alongside to help everyone reach their fullest potential, whatever that is. And that's true for my daughter, you know, all the way to someone here to, you know, I don't do any of them perfectly. And there are lots of times that I just thought if I just get caught up on emails, if I could just deal with this problem, it's, it's like potty training and all the things. Well, when we get out of diapers, well, when we start school, well, when we (laughs) move into middle school, well, when they can drive, there's just always that. The reality is that those that's, you know, it's not a downer for today, but I want the reality of like, 
life is not always grand and glorious, even with all the things no. <laughs> that there are lots of joys and blessings, you know, uh, seeing, you know, almost 1200 sessions done a month and lives changed, you know, through our practice, yeah. there are yeah. 32 people who invest here and are able to see, you know, what we're able to accomplish together and how God is working, you know, through us. There is teaming together with my family and seeing all of our gifts, you know, get used. So lots of awesome things, you know, at the same time, there are lots of hard things. Like it, it said often, um, if there's someone I, you know, that I, um, through our church, that's really been an influence and the business coach too, that's mentioned in the book is that life is always written on two rails. You never don't have those two rails. And one is the things that are really going well and what you're moving towards and can be passionate about and their positives. And then there's the rail of these are struggles right now. And these are trials and these are problems. And there, I really view there is no day that doesn't have those two rails. And some, it may be, well, I know that I'm on vacation or today is just yeah. a really awesome day for some reason, you know, yes. the first day of school. You know, we're getting close to school start. It's exciting, mm -hmm. you know, to have a new adventure mm -hmm. start, new teachers, new year. Our students are growing and developing, our children, you know, all these things. And then on the other side, but they're also moving to a point to where they will be further away from us one day. You know, mm -hmm. and they are growing up and needing us less, yeah. hopefully. And they are. You just, it's, uh, there's always two rails. It's, so it's so. bittersweet. If we do it right, that is the goal, but it's yes. still so bittersweet. But yes. So there's the second book. We'll use railroad the analogies. I don't know. <laughs> Let's totally do it. You should totally do that because I will read that book. <laughs> I will so read that book because your your daughter's a senior, correct? And my son yeah. is starting fifth grade. So he's not, they're not quite mm -hmm. 10 years apart. But I'm like, okay, so here's, here's my mentor who's about 10 years ahead yeah. of me in this parenting and practice game. So, but it's, yes. it's, it's still a beautiful gift that you have. And it's, you, you spoke to so much there about, well, balance doesn't mean that the scales are always equal. It just simply means, okay, so this day we're going to have more of these. We're going to have more of these. Mm -hmm. Potentially sometimes it does this. And nine times out of 10, when they do balance, we don't notice it anyway. We don't notice it when things are flowing smoothly. No. It's only when something tips when the scales in one smoothly, direction. We're just, yeah. We're just happy right. at that point. It's <laughs> right. more like a blender. And so you put the ingredients in for the day, you blend it up. Some days end up more positive than others. But there really is, it's not a scale where I'm putting only this much on the scale today or only this. I don't get to choose all the wildfires that I'm dealing with all day long. Yes. That's just a blender of like, okay, this is another opportunity I was not planning on. How do I, you know, screw this opportunity well and leave? this one that's a very good a very good metaphor and analogy <laughs> in talking about managing all the different demands that you know life puts on us whether you have one children one child or you have several children um if you're working or homeschooling or both um it you mentioned earlier that it's not always possible for you to compartmentalize because it's really not and in the book, you talk a lot about um, that desire to achieve and that desire to be driven. And a lot of times that is just part of our personalities. I say our because it was always a part of mine. Even now, though, what I do here is, is a hobby. I treat it as a job because I feel a responsibility to get things done on time and to produce a, pro a quality product to get the word out there to help others. You can take the counselor out of the helping field, but you can't really take the helper out of the counselor. It's still part of that innate desire in me. But what I have found that is common in personalities like ours when you are this driven, one thing we tend to forget to do is rest. We tend to forget to take that very much needed time for ourselves. Can you speak to any lessons that you've learned from rest and any tips that you can offer in kind of building that into your life? Mm -hmm. You're probably talking to the wrong person. <laughs> and oh. that there's a, there's it a piece be a lesson of what you're you learning currently. And there you okay. go. I think a big key is it's you know it's it's funny that you're asking this. It's taken you know 22 years you know of marriage for my husband and I to get to this point. But I think a struggle is you know there's not 
in the Bible, it's never really mentioning retirement and when retirement comes, like what is, you know, what is rest? You know, what is retirement? What is self-care? What are all these things? And I think it goes back to, you know, depending on God for the energy to overcome whatever obstacle I have in front of me right then. But a key that we've come to in our marriage is my husband realized that word for whatever reason, just just like boss, you know, it does not resonate like positive to me. Does and not so he came up with, okay. It does not. He came up with the word like get comfy. And that word I love. And so instead he'll be like, why don't, cause he would say, why don't you just go ahead and go home? I'll do this and you can rest. But why it bothered me is the reality is I knew when I got home, there was the laundry, the dishes, the child, oh. the, there was no to begin. Rest. Yes. <laughs> and so it wasn't that I was even going to rest. So when I got there, so to answer your question, I think part of it is changing it to when am I getting comfy and what I'm doing? Like, oh, I got to change clothes. So I'm getting to wear my comfy clothes while I'm doing mm-hmm. these other responsibilities. You know, am I looking at the tasks that need to be done? And am I really focusing on what's most important or is what's more important investing in relationships with my spouse and my child right now? Then 50 emails that are sitting in my inbox that I try to get through. But as I mentioned in the book, there's just going to be 50 more in the morning anyway. And I've learned that. So, so I would say, you know, can we get comfortable with the stewardship that we have right now? Because sometimes in life, especially with friends I have now who are caring for aging parents and caring for their children and, you know, working jobs and, and, and I could talk to them about self-care and rest, but is that really handling their stewardship the best that they can or is rest sometimes meaning I'm just going to sit for five minutes in the car so that when I go in I can make sure I'm in the place I need to be when I am you know engaging with whoever this is that I'm about to see like am I in the frame of mind that I need to be in to do that well So to me, rest may look different than someone else. I could carve out and set aside an hour on Sunday or Tuesday or Wednesday. Is it going to make a difference on Friday when I'm dealing with all those problems? Because I still don't want to deal with those problems when they come. Mm -hmm. But do I intentionally, you know, have a phone call with one friend who's now out of state every other week? Yes. But some wouldn't even call that rest. But to me, my rest is more, what am I building in that is depositing back and giving back to me? Yes. Not necessarily did I sit and watch a chick flick, which I could do, but it's not going to make a hill of beans difference tomorrow when I'm dealing with the problems I'm dealing with. (laughs) I mean, it's great. Sure. And some, that is just my personality. Like I could put in the, the two hour Hallmark movie, which, you know. I love doing those. Why? Because you know what the ending is going to be. But does it change, you know, the things I'm facing tomorrow? Maybe, maybe not. You know, it's like if we could go on vacation every other week, you know, then maybe we could come rejuvenated into every morning. Um, But I think it's more about like, am I investing in things that are giving back to me? And that speaks to the mentoring we were talking about earlier. It speaks to if there's counseling, you know, when I've chosen to be in counseling too, just like others choose with us, you know, it's, you know, and dry friends that I'm holding myself accountable to because those things will breathe life. Yes. Whereas some things we could schedule, but it's just a vacuum of time that was taken away. It, there's not, it didn't, you know, it wasn't necessarily something that's going to be lasting. So do I sit sometimes, you know, and lose myself for 10 minutes, you know, in a show or an Instagram or whatever? Well, sure. I mean, I think everyone does, but it's like, what am I gaining from this? And I think that's really what the book is about is like where your time is going. What is the result that you're wanting to Because if it's just an escape, we can escape, but then we have to come back to reality at some point. And so if I'm using it, whether it's viewing, I'm going to get comfy while I do the next task that I need to do. So I have a different frame of mind 
whether it's scheduling in things that will deposit back into me and bring life or, you know, like the running was, you know, at one point in time, or yoga can be now or whatever it is, is do I walk out with from that place or with a person with something that's lasting? You know, it will meet a need that can benefit myself in a lasting way or others. So I don't know that that fully gets where you wanted it to get, <laughs> but I, it's the word yeah. rest I've had to come to terms with. <laughs> Whatever you call it, there's there's a beautiful book I read eh, about a year ago, Sandra Dalton Smith, Sacred Rest. I don't know if you've read it. Absolutely phenomenal mm-hmm. book. But well, it talks about just that. Well, she's a physician from Alabama who wrote this book on rest and talks about the different types of rest that we need. I, I might have to send you that book. Um, but you said you don't know if if you're the best person to ask that question of. I disagree wholeheartedly. I think what you just shared is a very realistic view of rest, approaching rest from the idea of discernment and wisdom. That what fills up someone else's cup is not going to be what fills up yours. But if you've taken enough of that inventory to know, hey, this is what works for me and this is what fills up my cup. Absolutely. You you can make more money in your life. You do not get to get more time. So I think mm-hmm. d- with discernment, managing your time that well is going to allow you to that that is self-care. If you really think about it, it might not be society's definition of self-care, but it's yours. And if it works for you and your family, I think you're just mm-hmm. the right person to ask. So that's just challenging mm-hmm. listeners to find what works for them. Well, and that's well, thank okay. you for challenging me personally today, too. So uh, <laughs> it's was a it constant, my intention? Constant. Yes. I was like, she's using the word. It's the word. It's the rest word. No idea. It's been a year of of me talking with, you know, I've been talking to a mentor about it, you know, on and off for a year. You're just kidding. like, what, what is this word? No, Mm-mm. no, I'm trying to make peace with it. <laughs> Please know I'm laughing with you, not at you. I used to. Oh, agree. absolutely. Well, Rhonda, I want to thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your personal journey and your personal growth that you have been through. These stories are going to benefit so much, so much of our listeners and help them in their own journey and their own growth. I think sometimes we, uh, we are in mental health are kind of like the wizard behind the curtain. They forget that we are people too, and we face these challenges too. So hearing the challenges that you have overcome and are still overcoming, and it, it might knock you down, but you won't stay down for long is certainly an encouragement for me as a mom, as a fellow mental health professional, as a human being out here in this community. So thank you so much for being a part of our community. Absolutely. Thank you for having me today. So I hope it is a help to those who listen in. Thank you so much and blessings to you. We look forward to chatting soon. Yes, absolutely. Take care. Bye-bye.